believe that we need to be discussing is getting the money out of politics. It would change everything. And our ordinary citizens need health care. What is going to be done? We are facing 100,000 physician shortage, I understand, over the next 10 years. How are we going to build more medical schools? Nobody's talking. Well, let's go to Ed, who's calling from Bluffton, South Carolina, on the Republican line. Go ahead, Ed. Hey, good morning. Th thanks for my call. Ed, are you thanks safe from, first of all, you're in thanks South Carolina. Are you safe from the storm? Yeah, we're, um, we're going to be all right here. We're in the southern part of the state. And um, unlike two years ago when uh, Matthew hit, where we were the, the brunt and um, the, um, the very center of the storm, uh, we pray for those people, of course, up in the, up in the northern end uh, of our state um, to, uh, you know, to survive this and, and uh, get their lives back together again as soon as possible. But okay, the, the reason I'm calling is, is I, want to, I actually um, had um, listened to your program a couple of days ago when uh, FEMA was uh, being discussed prior to Florence's arrival. And there were I don't know, a number of calls that from people, most of all, uh, that had never experienced a hurricane. And um, because of Matthew here, we did in 2016, and I, I, I really want to uh, say two things. One, expand a little bit on what uh, Mr. Greenberg had said, where the, um, the, the, the real core of the, of the um, uh, recovery uh, and uh, the, um, uh, well, the recovery on, on these hurricanes really starts at the state and local level. Um, I think we've all seen that the, the disasters that, that Katrina caused um, with the result of having, you know, just incompetent um, people who were running the, the, uh, the especially New Orleans and, and the state of Louisiana. And uh, unfortunately, uh, pretty much the same thing was, was going on down in Puerto Rico for many, many years prior to the storm. But contrary to those situations here in Beaufort County, uh, South Carolina, 2016, uh, we had a Category 2 hit here. We had mass, just massive destruction. I'd never been in a hurricane before. I'm from the Midwest in, uh, initially. Never been in part of a hurricane before. We left, of course, um, and evacuated. And about seven days later, we came back to just total massive destruction, just houses just, just brutalized by, by, by trees. There's a, there was a report here that there was 200,000 trees that had that fallen during this, this, this storm, and some of which was uh, um, as a result of... Um, tornadoes with, within the hurricane but I, I want to really give the give a uh, pat on the back for our, our local government our state government um, Nikki Haley was the governor at that point and um, FEMA just did a wonderful job uh, at, at cleaning up this just massive mess and uh, I, I will say this too that I, I okay most of the, the, the wrap FEMA, up wrap FEMA, up for us Ed okay most of the FEMA uh, cleanup uh, was it took you know a number of months to do this and they did an outstanding job and it was under the direction of uh, President Trump all right coming up our weekly spotlight on magazine segment focuses on the free college movement and we'll have that conversation with Adam Harris of the Atlantic and later on the Senate is set to vote on landmark legislation next week dealing with the opioid crisis Washington Post health reporter Colby Itowitz joins us with a look and what's in the legislation. We'll be right back. Coming up this weekend on Book TV, tonight at 8 Eastern, Fox News host Janine Pirro discusses her thoughts on the Trump presidency and his detractors with her book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. When I went to a dairy and I came out and one of my press people said to me in the car, they said, Janine, they, there's already an article on what happened at the, at the dairy farm. And I'm like, really, what did it say? And it said nothing that I said, but they alleged that I said X, Y, and Z. And I remember sitting in the car, I didn't realize that it was fake news, but I said, how can I possibly run against someone where the fix is in? It's already rigged. They're saying I said things that I never said, that I did things that I never did five minutes ago. On Sunday, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern, coverage of the 2018 Brooklyn Book Festival with authors April Ryan and her book Under Fire, reporting from the front lines of the Trump White House. Eli Saslow with Rising Out of Hatred, the awakening of a former white nationalist. 
and Linda Greenhouse with her book, Just a Journalist. Then on Afterwards at 9 p.m. Eastern, political writer Derek Hunter discusses his book, Outraged Inc., How the Liberal Mob Ruined Science, Journalism, and Hollywood. He's interviewed by Brent Bozell, founder and president of the Media Research Center. Does anybody get a real point across on television in a minute and a half? No. No, they don't. And I, I'm guilty of it, too. You look for a way that something that can go viral. The producers are looking for something that can go viral. The network is looking for something that they can clip into a 39-second clip, put in a tweet, post on Facebook. That will go viral. It is, it's bad. It's good for business because you get a lot of eyes on it, but it's bad for conveying information. Watch this weekend on C-SPAN 2's Book TV. Washington Journal continues. For our weekly Spotlight on Magazine segment, we're going to talk today with Adam Harris, staff writer for The Atlantic, who wrote the article, America Wakes Up from Its Dream of Free College. Adam, we haven't heard much talk about this issue for, of, of, for a while. Why now? It's, uh, well, essentially, we're, we wanted to do a broad look at college affordability, right? And, and one of the um, most pivotal issues or contentious issues in the 2016 election um, was a sort of question of free college or, or affordable college. And, and as, as this college affordability crisis kind of reaches a fever pitch, we wanted to kind of um, take a step back and look at what happened to the free college movement. Um, and essentially, you saw that after the 2016 election, when a lot of people thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, um, and then you get a Donald Trump presidency, and all of that momentum that had been building um, since 2005 just kind of um, stops um, and, and shifts to the state level. Um, you know, you had this national movement, and then it just moves to the state. So kind of seeing where the states are, how those proposals look, and, and what um, free college, quote unquote, actually means in 2018. So where does the Trump administration stand on the question of free college? Well, uh, in 2016, um, Inside Higher Ed uh, asked Sam Clovis, one of the co-chairs of the Trump campaign, um, whether or not uh, President Trump would support uh, free college. And his answer was unequivocally no. Um, and you know, since then, you, you look at the priorities of the Trump administration on higher education, and, and they're not necessarily in the free college realm. I mean, free college um, and, and kind of getting behind this idea of free college isn't necessarily something that um, Republican lawmakers see as a kind of galvanizing issue, primarily as there's this distrust in higher ed. Um, and that kind of revolves around this um, college affordability question. So it's kind of, um, you know, a revolving door there. So let's define a little bit about what we're talking about here. What's the difference between tuition-free college and debt-free college plans? So a tuition-free college plan is essentially a plan that covers the tuition for a student, but it won't cover um, the rest of the expenses that are associated with college, right? So we're thinking housing, we're thinking food, we're thinking, um, you know, these, these basic necessities that college students need to live on a day-to-day -day basis, books. Um, a a debt-free plan is a plan that will cover all of those other expenses, right? So you have your books covered, you have your housing covered, you have your food covered, um, so that you don't have to take out loans to cover those necessary um, expenses for, for the rest of your college experience. And the issue with some of these tuition-free plans um, is that even though they do help um, you know, low-income students and middle-income students kind of um, pay for college and it helps create a college-going culture, um, they tend to be last dollar end programs. And essentially what that means is that uh, it is your cost after your grant aid is applied. So think about things like Pell Grants or, or um, basically financial assistance that students don't have to pay back. Uh, if, if you had a more debt-free model, right, you would have the tuition covered um, up front, um, so where your tuition might just be wiped away, and then you would be able to cover the rest of those expenses with your Pell Grant or with, um, or with other forms of, of grant assistance. Now, which state is doing what? Which, which, which one of those plans are the most popular plans, and which state is choosing which plan and why? So there are, there are two, two states that have kind of gotten the most attention um, in terms of their free college plans. One of them is Tennessee. Um, the other is New York. Tennessee uh, it's kind of uh, generally agreed that it's doing a very good job, primarily after it, it, it kind of expanded the access for its program. Uh, so not only is it a, a you know, does it have a tuition-free model? It's a last dollar end model, but it's a tuition-free model. Um, but it's also open to um, adult students and things of the sort. Now, New York um, has has received criticism because of some of the uh, some of the added um, bits of the plan. 
So we're thinking about um, a, a residency requirement, for example, to say that after you've um, after you've completed the plan, you have to live in the state for X amount of years, um, or it will convert into a loan. And that's that's something that people have sort of seen as an issue with with um, New York's plan. We want you to join in this conversation about uh, debt-free college, tuition-free college, college students. We want to hear from you. We want you to call in at 202-748-8000. College graduates, we want you to call in at 202-748-8001. And everyone else, including high school students looking to go to college, we want you to call in at 202-748-8002. And remember, you can always reach us on social media at C-SPAN WJN on Twitter and on Facebook at facebook.com slash C-SPAN. Now, tell me what the Kalamazoo promise was. The Kalamazoo Promise is kind of seen as, as where this free college movement started. It was a very simple idea in Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, that essentially, um, you know, this, this one morning, uh, you know, the, the principal of this high school comes over the PA system, as I write in the story, and, and he announces that an anonymous benefactor is going to be paying for the college tuition for all of the students in the district. Um, and it's kind of sort of a social experiment, right, to see will kind of offering this free tuition help the area economically? Um, and you saw, you did see kind of advances. You saw the schools improved, you, um, the enrollment numbers at the schools improved, the, uh, the, the city was able to build new schools for the first time since the 70s, um, and then businesses started coming back to the area because it's, it's, you know, you have this idea and you have this promise of bringing students and, and give, of giving students free tuition and allowing their parents, um, you know, not to have to worry about about some of those those extra um, issues with college affordability. We actually have a call from Chad, who's calling from Edisto Island, South Carolina. Let's go to Chad. Are you hey, there? Good morning. Thank, I'm here. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Thanks, C-SPAN, for the for their news. Um, I have a couple of things. One. There are ways to go to school without paying for it monetarily. I had a good friend in high school whose mother, and I went to high school in 81, researched um, sports scholarships that went unclaimed. And one of the high ones was tennis. So she got her daughter into tennis. Her daughter went to a full ride on a tennis scholarship. I was in the military. You can join the military and go through JROTC. One of the things I saw that was really interesting and kind of sad statement about our education was when Bernie Sanders said we need to make college free because back in my day college high school was the equivalent of college today you know that's kind of a sad statement about the education system but the bad thing about something free when you go look at something that people don't have to pay anything for take free housing for example somebody gets a free house you would think they would take good care of it you think it'd be in good shape hey you got it for free you would really cherish it but sadly, the absolute opposite is the truth. When you don't have anything ventured, when you have no skin in the game, then it doesn't mean anything to you. And that has nothing, that's the same for college, a car. You go to the high school parking lot and look at automobiles that were given out by their parents, an automobile that some kids work in at Publix to pay for. There's a big difference. And it's just, it's human nature. When you give something free, it has no value. You've taken the value out of it. But you can go, you can work hard at sports, you can join the military. There are ways to go to college without, you know, for people that can't afford it. But the other thing that we're missing out, too, is technical schools and trade schools, how they've taken those out of the education system. I'm a master electrician. I made my money with my hands. I mean, I've made a good living my whole life. It's something that's coming back around. We're graduating kids from college at a high rate, but they have no opportunity because they have – degrees and things that don't apply to the economic system of the world. So does free college devalue the, the uh, college degree? I think some people do argue that if you give something to someone for free, um, they aren't going to appreciate it as much. Um, and, and maybe we shouldn't be thinking about free college as much as we should make sure that college is as affordable as possible, right? Um, where, and that's, that's sort of one of the, the ways that the conversation turns where you have even in a red state like Tennessee you have advocates supporting these free college initiatives because it's not a completely free model it isn't a, it makes college affordable for students um, 
And then kind of to, to Chad's point about um, uh, career and technical education, um, there are several states where their free college programs do support career and technical education. Uh, and, and that is one of the kind of galvanizing issues, primarily on the Hill, um, where you have lawmakers, both Republicans and Democrats, and even um, kind of across the country. Uh, New America came out with a survey that uh, shows that, you know, a lion's share of Americans support career and technical education, and they support kind of that vocational education, um, whereas not as many Americans support, you know, this traditional idea of a liberal arts education. Right. Um, so I think that, that there are some tensions there between the free college and affordable college idea. Um, but generally, uh, I think that when people are thinking about free college, um, they're thinking about making college more affordable and accessible to more Americans. Now, are these programs geared toward, we, we just talked about technical schools. Are they also geared toward community colleges and private schools, private colleges, or are these just for public schools? So it tends to be public schools that are involved in the free college models. Um, so that would be community colleges. Some states allow it at two and four year institutions. Um, in fact, in a recent uh, um, analysis by the Education Trust, they analyzed um, you know, more than 15 of these, of these free college models and proposals. And um, they had eight criteria for the proposals, and one of them was whether or not uh, the state uh, model would have supported um, uh, two-year and four-year education, or just two-year education. And, and many of the states only support two-year education. You're only allowed to use it at, at community colleges. Let's go to John, who's calling from Corpus Christi, Texas. John, you graduated from college. Do you think this is a good idea? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, uh, it's more like the European model that uh, young people aren't saddled with a huge mountain of debt when they graduate from college. And uh, for millions of us college graduates, I graduated in 1995. I have never made more than $25,000 in a single year of my life, even with my bachelor's degree. Never been arrested, don't drive drunk, don't use drugs, come from a good family. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And unfortunately, the system got so many of us suckered into these student loans, knowing damn good and well that we'll never be able to pay them off, while at the same time deliberately shipping millions of American jobs overseas and bringing foreign workers in to lower the wages of Americans who still had jobs, and then replacing even millions of more jobs through technology. And yet they want to hold our feet to the fire to pay back these student loans all the way to the day we die. They follow us. We can't discharge them through bankruptcy court because Congress changed the laws affecting uh, college graduates, uh, I, I believe it was about 15 years ago, to where we can't discharge the loans through bankruptcy. They literally follow us to the day we die. So for millions of us college graduates, it's a choice between eating and keeping a roof over our heads or paying back the student loans. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to eat and keep a roof over our heads. So they need to cancel the student loan debt, write it off. Wall Street got bailed out in 2008 despite committing numerous uh, felony offenses and outright fraud, but us college graduates who took out the loans in good faith, thinking that we'd have gainful employment when we graduate, you know, the jobs just weren't there. So, so what do you think? <laughs> yeah, so um, to the point about kind of um, discharging loans in bankruptcy, it, it is possible to discharge your loans in bankruptcy, but it is extremely difficult. And that's one of the things that they're trying to change on the Hill, um, and, and, and not even necessarily trying to change, but there's, there's interest behind kind of getting, um, making it easier for students to discharge loans in bankruptcy. Um, kind of to your point generally about the, the affordability of college, um, you know, with the United States spends um, more per student per year um, according to the most recent OECD numbers, I think it's about $30,000 um, in uh, individual contributions um, and government assistance. So that's loans, it's grants. Um, then mo and then the average of developed countries, um, and, uh, excluding um, Luxembourg, if I'm remembering correctly. L Luxembourg might be the only country that, that spends a little bit more than the U.S. Let's go to Chris, who's calling from Cornelius, Oregon. Chris, you're a college student. What do you think about this? Are you Hello? Go ahead, Chris. I think it's a good thing. Uh, I'm actually one of the few people that can take advantage of the, the GI Bill as a veteran. Um, and it's definitely helped me out a lot, so I'm not getting in debt. Also, uh, working full-time, some uh, schools, uh, my work offers tuition assistance. Um, so I'm definitely for it. I was, and also, with the higher uh, technology, we need to at least think about adding another two to four years onto our K-12 through public schools, um, at least, uh, to do 
to get the technology and education that we need for today's advanced world. Thank you very much. With the free, uh, with with some of the free tuition free and debt free plans, moving toward community colleges. The, are we seeing an increase in those states that have these plans of people going to college or are this number of students staying about flat? So in Tennessee, uh, there, was a, there was a slight bump in Tennessee uh, recently uh, where you did see more people enrolling in these free college um, programs. Um, but it's, it's also very early, right, um, where uh, since 2005, you know, it's been 12, 13 years. Um, so we're kind of trying to see how the movement will develop, um, you know, as I as I write in the piece, the window is still open um, for free college and also for a national um, free college program. However, uh, if if kind of the political um, uh, the political situation remains um, what it is, where um, you have support for these programs among Democrats um, and particularly national Democrats, um, however, you're not seeing that similar support from national Republicans. Uh, it doesn't look like like you will have a, a national K through 14, K through 16 system um, anytime soon. What type of bill are we seeing in the Senate that Democrats are pushing? What, are, what exactly are they pushing and who's doing it? So Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii um, uh, introduced legislation in March uh, that would, that would um, have a debt-free college model. Um, and basically what he's trying to do is incentivize states. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the primary ways that, that uh, the federal government can be helpful is by incentivizing states uh, to introduce these models or can keep these models going. Uh, so basically what his bill would do is provide a one-to-one -one dollar match for, for states investing in higher education. And um, there's been a trend over the last you know three decades of kind of disinvestment in higher education. Um, where at a state level, um, you're seeing less and less funds going to higher ed. And when, when a state has to make budget cuts, it's not going to cut things like K-12, or it's not going to cut things like Medicare. It's going to cut um, in higher education. Uh, so essentially, what Schatz's bill would do is say, hey, if you guys spend a little bit more money on higher education, and particularly um, a two-year or four-year free college model, um, then we will um, give you, the federal government will give you a dollar to dollar um, on that um, investment. Let's go to Ron, who's calling from Ferndale, Michigan. Ron, what do you have for us? Yeah, I just uh, want to, like, the gentleman from Texas I thought was very good. I, um, I was wondering if Adam has done any research in Europe. Uh, Europe has seemed to have a wonderful system, and the Asian na nations have a wonderful system. And uh, why don't we go there and at least get some information from them. like Michael Moore. If a lot of people don't like him, but he had a one. His last uh, documentary was wonderful about all the. Uh, but people are afraid of socialism for some reason. They think it's uh, the devil or uh, whatever, and it's a one. It could be a wonderful system if um, if people work together. And uh, I appreciate my talking and. I really like uh, Washington Journal C-SPAN. Thank you. So essentially, it's kind of to, to the earlier point that people think that if you know we have a system of free college, then people won't value um, college as much. And there's also, um, you know, America, even for its 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 flaws in terms of how much college costs. Um, it is still seen as kind of a model of higher education, um, and and I think having 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 this sort of prestigious higher education system uh, is kind of one of the contributing factors to saying that maybe we don't, um, maybe we don't make that complete shift. Uh, as one of my colleagues, Aliyah Wong, wrote recently, um, you know, in most other developed nations, um, the most prestigious institutions are public, um, whereas in the U.S., um, the most prestigious institutions are typically private. Um, and you know, I think there would have to be a fundamental um, shift in the way that we deliver higher education, and people are thinking through those different things. Georgia Tech just recently released a report on what the Research University of 2040 looks like, and um, kind of trying to uh, visualize and say, okay, what what do we need to do to shift for the skills and the priorities of the current student body? Carol Old tweets in a question for us. Every day our country gets deeper in debt. Where are we going to get the money for free college for all? How are states paying for this? 
So that's actually one of the um, problems that that uh, that shifting to the state model has, um, where unlike the federal government, states have to run a balanced budget, um, and. Uh, states, as they are disinvesting more and more from higher education, um, it is it is kind of seen as as both a it's it's almost seen as a benefit and and an issue. Um, where with the Kalamazoo Promise model, one of their things was it's going we're gonna get an economic benefit from having a free college model. So not only are we going to have um, more a more educated population, but those those people will stay in the state, um, and they will. Um, it turns into sort of a, we're working here, we're living here, we're putting more dollars back into the system. Well, were they right? <laughs> well, in Kalamazoo, yes, um, where you did see the area had an economic bump. The schools were able to build new schools because they were, you know, their bond debt or their their bond ratings were a little bit better, so they were able to issue bond debt for the first time since the 70s. Um, so it does, you know, there is kind of an argument for it. Um, increasing uh, the economic uh, benefits of the area. Let's go to Mike, who's calling from Houston. Mike, what do you think about this? Good morning. Good morning. Um, the the areas of our lives where the inflation rate is the highest as consumers is in healthcare and in education, college tuition, and it is precisely in those two places where government intrudes the most. So the notion that government intervention is going to solve this problem is laughable based on, based on the inflation rate in and of itself. I'll give you one example. Um, K-12 schools from 1983 to 2013, National Review cited a study, I don't know where it was from, that the student enrollment in K-12 schools went up by 7%, but headcount in, in employees during that time went up by 55%. 55% increase. But what did we hear from President Obama? I don't, I, don't, I don't dislike presidents. I don't hate them. I just hate bad ideas. And what President Obama was saying in 2012 was we need more teachers. We had a 55% increase in the number of more employees in the student, in the K-12 environment, but no discernible increase in, in, in outcome. So the other thing is um, when, when consumers have a stake in the cost of the product or a good, the cost comes down. When you give free education, how long is it free? What incentive? How is it that we think that consumers, your neighbors, your, your people at work, how is it we, that we think that everybody has the same motivation, the same passion, the same drive, the same talent? We think we're all just built the same way. We're not. We have different talents, and some people can work with their hands. Not all of us have to land on the moon. And I don't understand why we have to have free this, free that. That's not going to be a solution. There are some people who still who doubt this. Yeah. Well, the argument isn't necessarily that if you have free college, then all students have to go to college. Um, the argument is that it provides an easier opportunity for students um, to be able to afford college. Because if with the Kalamazoo Promise, for example, the reason why there were students crying in the classroom um, is because they did not think that they could go to college before they introduced this, this free tuition model. Um, to say that my family could not afford this, now my family can afford for me to go to college. Um, so it's essentially, free college advocates argue that it is, it is the natural extension of the American dream to say that we should have our students be able to go to college affordably. Let's go to Bert, who's calling from Portland, Oregon. Bert, you graduated from college, what do you think about this? Yes, I did. And uh, student loan companies don't inform students that they have an income-based payment option uh, while their incomes are low. Instead, try to get as much money out of the students as possible. So I think everyone's loans should be reconfigured to what they would have been had the loan companies been honest with the students in the first place. Um, so uh, what, what he's talking about is the income-based repayment, which basically allows people to repay their debt um, based on the amount of money that they make. Um, and it's, it's, it was a, there was a big push um, to get people enrolled in IBR programs um, under the Obama administration, and that sort of continued um, under, under uh, the Trump administration. Um, 
And of course, as, as kind of Congress and as, as the department is going through its shifts and reconfigurations and how it is um, holding student, lo um, student loan companies um, and student loan servicers in particular accountable, um, they are considering you know, how, how the companies are communicating and, and telling people about um, whether or uh, telling people about their options um, for repayment and several states have introduced um, these sort of student loan bill of rights um, that that basically say that you know these are the things that student loan companies have to do while servicing loans let's go to bill from huntersville north carolina bill hopefully you and yours are safe in the storm hello hello go right ahead we hear you okay can you hear me good well Listen, I have a parcel solution, not for everybody, but I think it would help a lot of students. Of course, I don't believe in free anything, so I want to know where you, I'm coming from. But there are things that have to be helped. People have to be helped. I had a high school education, and I went to a company, and I worked 100% commission all my life. But the reason I made good money, $100,000 and more, in the 80s and the 90s, because I went out and worked and knocked on doors and made, made people want to buy my product. And anybody can do that if they want to work. But getting back to the free education, and that's what I don't want to brag about myself, but my daughter graduated from high school in the late 70s. She went into a college in Pennsylvania and took the easiest course she could get. And I, saw, and I was paying for it. She didn't have a student loan. But the thing about it is, I went, I didn't like what she was taking. And I don't think there was any future in it. So she didn't know. I went up and talked to the counselors. And I talked to them, told them a little bit about my daughter. She was an average student. And when she was young, she loved kids. For an example, on the way home from first grade, there was a boy on the bus. The kids used to make fun of him and, 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 and get him upset. My daughter went and sat beside him and helped him. For the rest of the year, she helped that little kid get along and helped the other students from picking on her. Okay, and Bill, the mother Bill came up, wrap, wrap it up for us. Okay, I'm going to say that you have to go talk to a counselor and, and get the right and talk and tell the counselor how your daughter is what she's made of and how she what she wants to do and get so she got into speech and hearing he said that's a coming thing there's going to be a lot of jobs with good money so she got her master's in speech and hearing and she's in it today she's very very wealthy bye-bye are there limits on what classes you can take under these tuition-free and debt-free college programs? In some states, um, there are. Um, and that is one of the things that primarily equity advocates um, and, and free college advocates generally um, are not uh, as fond of, to say that there are only a limited number of programs that a student can, um, can take under, under free college programs. Well, we'd like to thank Adam Harris of The Atlantic for bringing us up to date on the free college and tuition-free and debt-free college plans around the country and their possibility in the future. Adam, thank you. Thanks for having me. Coming up, the Senate is going to take up landmark le legislation early next week dealing with the opioid crisis. Washington Post health reporter Colby Itwitz will join us with a look at the legislation and tell us about, what, about what's going to happen. We'll be right back. Sunday night on Q&A, historian Richard Norton Smith discusses his biography of Herbert Hoover, an uncommon man. Hoover said, when all is said and done, accomplishment is all that matters. Which, when you stop to think about it, is a rather unsentimental, um, the sort of thing you would expect an engineer to say. And that's one of the keys to understanding his life, his success, in everything but the presidency. Sunday night at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN's Q&A. American History TV is in prime time next week on C-SPAN 3. Starting Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 
A discussion on the role of black teachers in the South who fought against school segregation with Emory University professor Vanessa Siddle Walker. Tuesday, a symposium on the concept of liberty, exploring how the ideas of freedom, law, and liberty have changed throughout history. Wednesday, on oral histories, our Women in Congress series continues with former Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey and Nancy Johnson. Thursday, historians look at the role of espionage in U.S. conflicts over the past century and a half. And on Friday, on Real America, the World War II film series Why We Fight, about the outbreak of World War II to Pearl Harbor and the rise of authoritarianism in Germany, Italy, and Japan. Watch American History TV next week in prime time on C-SPAN 3. Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward is our Washington Journal guest Monday at 7 a.m. Eastern talking about his new book, Fear, Trump in the White House. And then on Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, former independent counsel Ken Starr joins us to discuss his book, Contempt, a memoir of the Clinton investigation. Watch next week on C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Washington Journal continues. Colby Ikowitz from the Washington Post. What's going to happen with the opioid legislation in the Senate on Monday? It is expected to pass overwhelmingly Monday evening when the Senate returns um, from their weekend home. Uh, they, it is a package of 70-some different bills and proposals from lawmakers, Democrats, Republicans, independents, uh, kind of chipping away at the opioid crisis. Give us some of the highlights of what's going to be in that bill passing the Senate. Yeah, so what the thing that most people are talking about is this uh, bill from Senator Rob Portman out of Ohio. And essentially what that would do is give the U.S. Post Office um, more power to stop the inflow of fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is an incredibly potent and fatal opioid that we're seeing a big increases in use. Mm -hmm. um, the House has already passed its own bill. It has. What are the major differences between what's going to pass the Senate on Monday and what the House did earlier? So the bills are very, very similar. One of the major differences is this very obscure uh, IMD exclusion. This is something that came from the 1965 Medicaid, when uh, Medicaid was uh, enacted in 1965. It does not allow Medicaid to pay for mental health institutions. And so what happens there is people that need to go get mental health help and also substance abuse help aren't able to use their Medicaid. Uh, the House uh, overturns that rule. The Senate does not. We want you to join in this conversation about the soon to be passed bill in the Senate about battling the opioid crisis. If you're in the Eastern and Central time zone, we want you to call in at 202-748-8000, Mountain Pacific, 202-748-8000. 8001. And if you've been impacted by the opioid crisis and you want to talk about what led the Congress should be doing, we want you to call in at 202-748-8002. Now, as we said earlier, the House passed this bill a while ago. The Senate's just getting around to it now. What were the objections that made the Senate bill take so long? Mostly it was the calendar. It was timing. Uh, the Senate has been bogged down, as we know, this summer with the Supreme Court nomination. It's taken up a lot of the oxygen. Uh, there was some small little things that they were tinkering with um, behind the scenes, but for the most part, it was uh, their just their ability to, to fit, fit it in on the floor. And what's been the reaction from the health industry and from the advocacy groups? Because opioids have been a crisis in America for the last few years. What's the reaction from industry, from advocacy? Largely disappointment. Uh, it is what they say is a very small effort. Uh, there's a lot of grant programs. There's a lot of expanding of existing programs. There's no real additional funding. And if you talk to public health advocates, what they say is we need an infusion of long-term funding the way we did with the HIV uh, crisis. Uh, and with absent that, you're really not going to make much of a difference. So what kind of spending does this bill provide? What does the Senate bill provide? So there, the one big thing in there is grant money for recovery centers. And the idea there is we need to increase access to treatment for people with opioid addictions. And so these recovery centers would provide temporary housing, job training, 
um, other treatment and recovery services. And but but it's a grant program, and and people would have to apply for this. This is not a universal federal program for everyone. And so one public health advocate actually said to me, "Try telling a town that uh, is ravaged by opioids that the big solution coming from Washington is that they can apply for a grant." So are they considering this to be more of a political election year bill than a bill that's actually going to be effective in fighting this crisis? Uh, one public health advocate I spoke to called it a political document. <laughs> really? Uh, because this is ravaging uh, towns and cities uh, all over the country. It is not uh, as indiscriminate in, in who it's impacting, and Democrats and Republicans alike both want to be able to tell their constituents they're doing something, mm -hmm. which is why you see 70 different proposals uh, included in this package. Let's go to Velma, who's calling from Far Rockaway, New York. Velma, you're on the air. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. I'm calling because my family is impacted. My uh, oldest son is dealing with addiction, and it the fam it has impacted the whole family. I have lived in fear. He's have been overdosed a few times he he survived them and i'm living in fear that any time that i'm going to lose him but the issue was that early on he was arrested at 11 years old and and searched inappropriately and psychologically that i feel i didn't get the help for them him that lead led him into this coming up trying to escape with the uh suction and I failed as a parent I must admit that too being that I was a young mother do you think this federal leg this I legislation would, is going to help at all I would hope it would help it would be helpful that at least people be able to have the uh the antidote and I forget the name of the medication and be able to survive because I would like to see everybody Everybody have a chance at life to really live life is the healthiest possible way and get the help that they need. The Senate and the House have to put together their separate bills into one. Do we already know who's going to be on that conference committee? Are there likely names that we're going to see doing that final negotiation? We ha don't have names yet. I think that'll happen after the Senate uh, approves the bill on Monday. Uh, but you're likely to see Senator Rob Portman. He's been a leader on this. Uh, Senator um, Lamar Alexander kind of helped negotiate behind the scenes. Uh, on the Democratic side, you've seen people like uh, Joe Manchin from West Virginia. West Virginia is a state that's been hit the hardest, or one of the states that's been hit the hardest. Uh, but that remains to be seen who will actually be on the conference committee. What's the reaction from the White House? Is the White House pushing this legislation, or have they been silent throughout this process? So they were, um, they, they declared opioids a public health crisis uh, last year, and while the Senate was kind of figuring out when they were going to find time to vote, they were still negotiating behind the scenes. Uh, President Trump tweeted about the issue of fentanyl coming over the border, saying that it was uh, ridiculous that the Senate couldn't uh, come and act, you know, the tweet was in all caps. And so some people think that that might have lit a fire, uh, that president bringing attention to it. Do we see this coming up in midterm election campaigns? Is, are opioids a campaign topic for anyone right now? You know, healthcare in general is the biggest issue uh, on the campaign right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear Democrats talking about it all the time. It's the only thing they want to talk about. And so they fold opioids into that particularly around issues like Medicaid expansion and making sure that everyone has access to affordable health care because treatment is such a huge part of overcoming addiction. Let's go to John, who's calling from Westfield, Massachusetts. John, good morning. Yes, good morning. Yeah, my comment is, you know, all this, these programs that you're speaking about here and addiction and all, these are mostly our domain building. Drugs are going to keep on coming no matter what you do. What, uh, what needs to be done is to go to the root causes of the problems, why people take the drugs in the first place, poverty, probably many other things too. It's a long-term long -term thing, but there's no simple answers. You know, you can't legislate morality. People are going to do drugs a certain number. Well, we all, but just uh, these programs that are going on are just not doing anything other than building up domains, 
um, spending more money on law enforcement and all that. That's my comment, too. Are these programs doing any good? He raises a really great point, which is that a lot of public health advocates say we're not dealing with the root of the problem, which are the social determinants of health, things like uh, education and jobs and access to health care and, and purpose in life, meaning and purpose. And without those things, that's when you see instances of uh, mental health uh, worsening, substance abuse addiction. And so there is something, some programs in this bill, expansions of programs and, and, and again, grant programs uh, to look at trauma in children and to see if you can heed this off before these kids become addicted. What's the timeline we see here? The Senate's gonna vote on Monday. How long is it gonna take the House and the Senate to come up with something that they can send to the president? It is very unlikely that anything's gonna happen before the November midterm. There's just not enough days left on the calendar. Uh, I think that there's a sense of urgency to get it done before the end of the year. So we'll see there's also a lot of things to, to get done before the end of the year, including making sure the government doesn't shut down. So maybe they'll try to loop that in with that, or maybe it'll get punted until 2019. Let's go to Mike, who's calling from Stratford, Connecticut. Mike, you're on Hi, the air. Um, Hi, my name is Mike. I'm a retired police captain. I'm 73 years old. I fell when I was 65 years old. I have chronic pain. Uh, they can't even tell what's wrong with me with a lot of my problems. The only way I could function was to be on uh, opioids, a very mild one, hydrocodone, the lowest uh, you could get, right? I need one or two pills a day. I can't get it. My doctor's afraid. He's afraid of the bureaucrats in Washington. So I'm suffering, and I take Advil, which my doctor told me is no good for my kidney. My kidneys are questionable. But the only way I could move around is to take the Advil. Maybe I'll move a couple hours a day. If I don't, my feet swell. But yet the bureaucrats in Washington know best. They know what's good for me, and they tell my doctor what's good for me, and he is petrified. And there's a lot of people in my situation which it is an outright crime. You have people taking fentanyls to commit suicide because they're in chronic pain. Yet we are all lumped into the same drug, uh, whatever you want to call it, like I'm a junkie. I'm a 73-year-old retired police captain that cannot function at all unless I take pain medication. Then I could go out and do a little, out, do a little outside work to keep my body moving. So if any kid thing could be done for somebody like me, I would appreciate it. I, I would appreciate a comment if you have it. I, I'd like to answer any question you may have. It's a very common complaint. This is a tricky balance right now that the uh, FDA and, and the lawmakers are trying to figure out how do we make sure that people with chronic pain who really do need these pain medications have access to them while also ensuring that the people that might abuse them don't abuse them. One idea that's actually in the legislation are these things called blister packs where you would allow uh, doctors to prescribe opioids in limited doses, maybe uh, three pills at a time or seven pills at a time. Some might find that um, uh, you know, not very. <laughs> it, you'd rather go to the pharmacy and and get a month supply than having to worry about doing it. You know, every couple of days or every week. But the problem is, there's lots of people that uh, you know, doctor shop. They they go across state lines and they try and get opioids from various doctors. And there's 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 got to be a crackdown on that as well as figuring out a way to make sure that people still have their pain meds. And I'm not sure that uh, the lawmakers fully uh, get that get that right. Let's go to Carl, who's calling from Crownville, Maryland. Carl, yes. go ahead. Yes, good. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, since the pharmaceutical companies are the ones that uh, produced, promoted, and profited from the sale of these opioids, why aren't they taking the financial responsibility for fixing the problem, as in financing rehab centers and what have you? What's the pharmaceutical response to, to this legislation and to this crisis? Yeah, the pharmaceutical response uh, to the public is that they want to be involved. They want to take a, a leading role on solving this crisis. Behind the scenes, what we hear from public health advocates is that they were pretty uh, forthright in uh, stopping lawmakers from putting in anything that was really going to limit uh, their profits or hurt their ability to manufacture these opioids. 
Now, part of the bill, in, uh, the, if I remember correctly, part of the Senate bill includes the U.S. Postal Service right. stepping up right. on the importation of illegal opioids yes. from outside of the United States. Talk a little bit about what that is and what yeah. that's about. So that was uh, the Senator Rob Portman's bill that I was talking about earlier. We have seen a huge influx in fentanyl uh, coming into the country. It is incredibly potent. It is You can't detect it. Um, and so they mail it in from China, uh, and then they cross it over the border. And people are using it to lace all kinds of drugs, not just heroin, but cocaine as well. It's being found in um, illicit pharmaceutical pills. Uh, so some people are taking fentanyl and not even knowing that they're taking fentanyl. And it is very fatal. Uh, we've seen deaths skyrocket. Uh, from fentanyl overdose. So what this bill would do is it would give the U.S. Post Office uh, more authority to ask questions about what's in the packages, where it's coming from, what's in it, uh, in hopes that they will, um, will stop some of the inflow. Let's go Scott, who's calling from only New York. Scott, go ahead. Oh, uh, yes. Good morning. Good Scott, morning. The human. Um, this, this problem was caused by the pharmaceutical companies in the, in the uh, government years ago because um, in the 90s I was living in Tennessee, they came out with the Oxycontins that were supposedly not addictive, but the people were taking them, breaking them up and sniffing them or they're shooting them in their arms and, and it started. See, somebody who's experimented with drugs all his life, opiates, when you first start taking opiates, they're doing a trick, they're making you nauseous, they're, break, they're taking the pain away, but they actually kind of make you feel sick. Now, once you take them for a little while, then you get a tolerance to them, and instead of making you sick and making you feel bad, they make you feel high, and they make you feel good. I stayed away from all of them all my life. Well, when I was in 2002, I had arthritis in my knees so bad, and I didn't touch any opiates, but the doctor got me on Darvocets. All the Darvocets did was put my tolerance back up, and I, I found out what the addiction is like or what you want. Now, last five months ago, I took an eight-minute dirt nap, uh, I sniffed some fentanyl, went up my nose, and I went to heaven for about eight minutes. Luckily, there was a police officer who saw me laying on the street dead, uh, hit me three Narcans later. Narcan is something everybody who would you care about your family and your kids or whatever, get you some Narcan and have it uh, on hand so if anybody ODs. Now, um, with, with fentanyl, I got hit three times with Narcan, and I barely came back. When I come alive in the ambulance, ladies like, everybody told me you were dead. I just kept on pumping your lungs full of air because I knew you were coming back. This fentanyl is bad because of that fact. It's very potent, and you don't need to shoot it up. You can sniff it, okay? Um, we need to do something about that. But the best thing to do in my 56 years of life and things is we need to educate the kids. It's not... You know, when I was a kid, a heroin addict was somebody laying in the flipping streets like a, like a, like a wine or something. It was looked down upon. These kids today look at this heroin as like it's a, it's fun and games, and it's like a badge of honor if you died and came back. No, it is not. And if you play with fire, everybody, you're going to get burnt. Right. Yeah. We so is there more money for, pre for prevention and saving, saving opioid addicts in this bill? There are um, expansion to the type of antidotes that uh, he was talking about, making sure that first responders and law enforcement have this injection that they can give people that have overdosed that is highly effective, uh, making sure that they're trained to do so. Uh, what public health advocates will say is it, there's not enough of are medication-assisted treatments, which are things like methadone, where you're giving someone a small amount of the drug to help with uh, withdrawal and to help with cravings and to help them get over their addiction. It's a, it's a controversial because you're giving people the drug, these illegal drugs, but uh, they're shown to be the most effective in helping people uh, get over their addictions. Is there an argument between the House and Senate over funding uh, recovery centers in these two different bills? I don't believe that there's an argument because there's not that much funding, to be honest. It's, it's, it's maybe um, a couple billion dollars over several years, but mm -hmm. that compared to uh, what public health advocates say we need, which is tens of billions of dollars over the next couple of years to really address this, I don't, I don't expect the funding to, to be a major sticking point. Let's go to Elizabeth, who's calling from Friendswood, Texas. Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Yes, um, I'm calling to say how this crackdown on opiates has affected my family negatively because 
I suffer severe arthritis and from back surgeries, and I have toyed with the thought of suicide so many times because I live in so much pain on a daily basis that I just want to scream. My sister just had uh, open heart surgery and valve replacement, and they won't even give her pain meds for that. My mother is severely arthritic and has had major surgeries, and they're not giving her pain meds. We are suffering hour by hour, and this is not our choice. And yet we can't get the pain medication we need because people are out there abusing this, and they're getting all the attention and being told that, oh, my goodness, we need to go ahead and worry about saving your lives. Well, our quality of life has been so affected that it's affecting our daily health. I also suffer from stage four kidney disease. Now, with all these problems, all I'm getting is tizanidine muscle relaxers and uh, lidoderm pain patches. Like I said, I can barely move and I scream in pain all night long. How do we walk that line between keeping it from people who are abusing it and people who need it? Right. So one of the things that the Senate bill does is it's asking NIH, uh, the National Institutes of Health, to research um, and develop uh, non-addictive pain medications. So we're talking about things that would would um, make her and her family feel uh, better with, with the amount of severe chronic pain that they have but not be addictive. And so that is something that's being worked on. But until then, we, like I said before, we do have this really tricky balance between making sure that, you know, there was a new survey out uh, just yesterday from the government that there were 11.4 million opioid uh, misuses uh, last year. And that's a, that's a lot of people. Are they moving um, non-addictive painkillers on fast track? with any of this legislation? Is that something they're thinking about as well? They're thinking about it, yeah, it, it's in there. Um, so we'll see. Explain a little bit more about what that would be about. Yeah, the way I understand it is it's just asking um, the FDA to uh, approve these things quicker. It mm -hmm. takes a really long time to get a drug um, approved through the FDA. It's a very long and cumbersome process for the drug manufacturers, and so it would prioritize uh, these non-addictive painkillers. Let's go to TJ, who's calling from Hermosa Beach, California. Go ahead, TJ. Good morning. Um, I the, the lady who just uh, called, I, I, I feel her pain. I completely understand it. The police officer they called, um, it's, it, it's absolutely true. Um, I, I, back surgeries, knee surgeries, I've been through it all, 15 to 17 surgeries, so many I, I, I can't even count. Um, and... You can't sleep, you're in pain, you do that for a couple of days, uh, the government, all of these statistics, they're wrong, treatment centers, they're fake, they're, 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 they're money grabs, that's all it is. Um, they need to, ed education is the only way that people need to be educated on what they're taking, what it is they're taking, and truthfully what can happen when you take these things. Is there any money for education in this bill? There is. There, there's money for public awareness campaigns, for outreach, there's, like, there's money for schools to begin uh, education programs around opioid use, but public health advocates will say that while prevention is very, very important, we need, but we are so far along in this crisis, uh, it is, we missed the boat on that, that we should have been doing that 20 years ago. But now we really need to figure out how to help the people who are severely addicted and that are dying, the tens of thousands of people that are dying um, every year, uh, get the treatment and recovery that they need. Let's go to Zach, who's calling from Leland, Mississippi. Zach, go ahead. Well, America, I just wanted to give you a, a small example of how, as how this is basically the poison, the fruit from a poison tree, and the, and the tree who person who planted this tree was John Anslinger, when he made marijuana illegal, because I am the I I'm I have history of hereditary pancreatitis, and um, I've had it over thirty times, and uh, 
but the last time I had it was approximately about three years ago. My aunt, which is deceased now, she she told me, and I was on my dying bed. I hadn't ate, eaten in 14 days, coughing up blood. She advised me to smoke some marijuana. I had ridden my wheel and everything. One puff of marijuana. I mean, less than two seconds, I was on my feet. I mean, <laughs> I mean, trying to eat everything in the house. And it's all because of people like Jeff Sessions and his and his uh, association with tobacco and big pharmaceutical companies that that want to 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 push these these man-made drugs on people instead of natural herbs that man has been messing with since the beginning of time. What do we? What can we expect to happen on Monday? Once again, in the Senate. Yes, on Monday you will see uh, the Senate vote on a sweeping opioids package that deals with uh, prevention, recovery, and treatment.